Hey, 909, and uh, we just had Delegate John Hardy, Vice Chair of Finance in the House with us, and now we turn our attention to a member of the Senate Finance Committee, uh, Senator Jason Barrett. Good morning, Jason. How are you? I'm doing well, guys. Good morning. Good morning, Senator. Well, uh, there's some activity already. As uh, (laughs) John said, they've already passed the 50% personal income tax cut. They'll have to read it. I think Wednesday will be the final one, and then it will go off to the Senate, I presume. Jason, what do you think the Senate will do with that? Well, I mean, we're, we're certainly going to take a good hard look at personal income tax reduction. I think that um, we've clearly been on board with reducing personal income tax. Uh, I think we're going to move forward with it. I would not expect us uh, to to just run this bill through that quickly and, and, and pass it on. I think we're going to uh, take a little harder look at it than the House did. I think we're going to have, um, you know, just to make sure that, that it's affordable. The governor talked about a lot of spending, uh, new spending in his state of the state address. So, you know, as members of the Senate, we need to look at how much the governor wants to spend. We need to look at the cost of this tax cut, uh, tax cut moving forward, uh, what the revenue a- estimates are uh, in the out years. And uh, and really, the governor's uh, just put out a five-year revenue projections, um, and they are uh, really high in, in, in a lot of our opinions. And you know, we've had tremendous growth in our state's economy for a number of years. Um, I, I think it could be a, a little dangerous to assume that we're going to have those ty- that type of growth moving forward. So uh, we're certainly going to, to, to evaluate the plan as much as we can. We want to cut personal income tax, uh, but just don't expect us to do it uh, in a day or two. Jason, do the uh, senators still have an interest in somehow incorporating a personal property tax cut in either with this bill or in a separate bill this term? Well, certainly, as you all know, that those of us that um, examine this a little more carefully to understand what has the biggest economic impact uh, for our state moving forward, what what brings um, uh, people to West Virginia, what brings capital investment to West Virginia, certainly eliminate 100% elimination of personal property tax uh, does that. And, and we don't have that uh, the ability or the authority to do that. So uh, right now, I believe our focus is on personal income tax, um, but 60 days is a long time. So we're, we're, we're working through a lot of things. We have a, a lot of ideas. We have uh, great members are here in the Senate, and, and, and we're looking to figure out what is the best plan Uh, for West Virginia moving forward. Yeah, Jason, you said that uh, uh, you may look at the governor's uh, 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 budget as being being realistic or not, whether they've actually overinflated. In the past, the Senate has criticized the governor for lowballing their estimates. Uh, And now I'm hearing you say just the opposite, that you're looking at them for actually overinflating their estimates. Well, I'm not so sure how critical the Senate has been over some of the revenue. Some of that is is, is really members of the legislature has wanted the governor uh, to, to lowball them a little bit uh, simply because this governor likes to spend money at times. And so when we lowball the, the revenue estimates a little bit, um, you know, that controls spending. But, you know, the natural growth in the economy that we've talked about a long time uh, on this show over the past year or more uh, is about 140 to $141 million a year. That's that over the past 30, 40 years, typically the natural growth is $140 million a year. So that's why we've always been comfortable with these flatline budgets for the past four years to be able to spend uh, an additional $600 million without putting us in a, uh, a tough financial position moving forward. Now, our revenue growth over the past several years has been far exceeded that $140 million. And what the, the, the interesting thing there, and I, I don't want to get too far down in the weeds with this, but the governor has told us this year for fiscal year uh, 24 that, that we're getting ready, that's the budget we're working on, that the revenue estimate is $4.8 uh, billion. And, uh, but when his staff hands out revenue projections, uh, that number is $6.1 billion. So that's, the governor has put the, the, tax cut into the general revenue surplus section of the budget. So this is an ongoing tax. This is a permanent tax cut uh, that's several hundred, seven hundred million dollars just with a 30 percent. And then when it's fully implemented, you're talking about one and a quarter billion dollars. And he's putting something like that in the general revenue surplus section of the budget that only gets funded if there is a surplus. And so I'm not really I don't know that I 
fully understand why he's doing that unless that if we don't pass the tax cut this year that he doesn't want us the ability uh, to spend uh, any money or give any other type of taxes. I'm not sure what his motive is, but he's telling us the revenue, the budget he gave us is revenue estimates of $4.8 billion. On the piece of paper that they're handing out, our revenue projections are 6.1. And in the out years, even higher than that. And, and that, again, assumes this tremendous growth that we've been having. And it, it assumes that our severance tax collection uh, is going to continue to stay high or go even higher. And a lot of folks think that, um, you know, we've reached the, the peak on our severance tax uh, revenue and, and that that could dip down. And there are going to be tough years. It's every economy experiences great years and really poor years. And I think it's, it, it's dangerous to, to make these assumptions moving forward that our revenue estimates are in the $6 billion to $7 billion range when we've been working on budgets in the four point six eight range. Again, we've had these great years where we've had a, a lot of excess revenue, uh, but you cannot expect that huge trend to continue. My next question, I'm going to get the wrath of Senator Barrett. I know that. But have we not gone past the point that the Senate can can reject the 50% personal property tax uh, suggestion from the House, gone back from the political aspect? The, the personal income tax. Personal income, impri- yes, yes. Well, no, I, I mean, I, look, we want to do a 50% personal income tax reduction. I, that's what we're working toward. I, I, that is by no means off the table. I think it's very much on the table. Uh, but you also have to, moving forward, and the reason I'm, I'm – talking cautiously and that I, we want to take a prudent approach to this and we want to do our homework and make sure we get this right, um, the governor has a lot of new spending um, in his budget. And we have to balance tax cuts and new spending. So um, that's what we're working through right now. Okay, you talk about new spending. Uh, we talked with um, uh, John Hardy a few minutes ago about the needs that have been recently expressed by DHHR, PEIA, the jail costs, the uh, uh, the pay raise, the teachers and state employees and the like. Uh, you, go ahead, Jason. You, yeah, you, you just mentioned several hundred million dollars. Yes, I, I realize uh, that. And that's, that's why I, I, I'm wondering the fact that uh, there's this – this personal property tax uh, it's become a political issue, become a very favorable political issue. Have we not gotten past the point that the Senate can pull back on that? On oh, personal income tax. Personal income well, tax, I, exactly. Yeah, I mean, we're like I said, we've, we're committed to reducing personal income tax. We're, we're not trying to pull away from that at all. We're just trying um, to do it right. And we're just, you know, we have, today's only day 54, 54, whatever it is, uh, or day three or four, we have 54, 55 days left. We have plenty of time to get this right. That's all I'm saying is that we're going to take our time and get it right. We're not going to, you know, the, the House, and, and I understand exactly where that was over there for a number of years. I understand exactly where they are on these issues, and, you know, they wanted to get the bill out quickly. It's, it's something they're working on, but but we're looking at that additional spending the governor wants to do and, and trying to find the right balance here. But but I, 50% is exactly what we want to do, and, and we are in no way backing away from reducing personal income tax. Kevin. Yeah, Jace, let's uh, uh, thank you for uh, coming on today. I appreciate it. Sure. Keep keep up the good work down there. Um, you talked about DHHR, and, and you and I have had several conversations about the happenings or lack of happenings over at DHHR, and I was just wondering how, how forefront is that uh, with, with the Senate at this point to be able to work on the issues that may or not be happening over there? Well, we passed a bill out on day one that that broke up DHR, DHHR uh, in three different uh, agencies, and and there isn't one person in the state of West Virginia that understands every aspect of DHHR. That person does not exist, and DHHR is too big, it's too cumbersome, uh, and it's too much for any one person to run. And that's why we've uh, we passed a bill that uh, divides it into three different agencies. Uh, I don't have. I wish I had some of my notes with me. I don't. I just stepped out of caucus to take this call, so I don't have a lot of the notes on on the bill in front of me. But uh, that's something that we've been working for for a number of years. That uh, former Secretary Crouch uh, fought us on. Um, it is the right thing to do. I think there's there's certainly agreement between the House and the Senate on that issue, um, and I would expect the House uh, to take that bill up 
uh, relatively quickly and, and make whatever necessary changes they feel are necessary. And then we'll, uh, you know, we'll go back and forth between the House and the Senate to work it out. But, but uh, we are absolutely uh, doing what we can to make uh, DHHR more efficient. Uh, it is anything but that. Um, it is, I, and I don't know of any secretary in the past uh, who has been the, had the ability uh, it's been too big for them to manage as well, and the, and the department, the agency, is only growing, and, and this is a step forward uh, to divide the, the agency up uh, to three different agencies to ensure that we uh, get the best bang for our buck as we as we help people in West Virginia, um, and so and just to be more efficient. So does that does that mean that there's now going to be three uh, different heads of these agencies or three different secretary spots, or how does that work? That's exactly what. And, and just as we did with commerce in the past, uh, where tourism, where economic development was under was under commerce, uh, the, the governor broke that up uh, with the legislature approval, obviously, and created a uh, secretary level position for uh, economic development, and then also for tourism that has been elevated. So this will do exactly that. All right, thank you. Question for you from one of our listeners, Damon Wright, who's a member of the Board of Education, says, uh, can you ask Senator Barrett why the Campus Self-Defense Act allows for institutions to restrict carrying in a daycare or a secure area used by law enforcement on the property of the state institution for higher ed? Why are there so many carve-outs? Well, I, I think there are carve-outs to be able to get the bill passed. I mean, that's, that's the political reality of it, that... Uh, when you have WVU and Marshall, who in the past have fought um, uh, folks being able to protect themselves on college campuses, um, you know, I think that this was an effort, and I, as Senator Phillips, who I know very well, is the lead sponsor of this bill, uh, and I would, I'm making somewhat of an assumption, but I think it's, it's probably a fair assumption that, that, that this has been some negotiation with uh, some of our institutions of higher education. Uh, to get them to back off fighting the bill. But uh, it, it's a bill that, that almost passed the legislature a couple of years ago, passed the House. I think it died in Senate Judiciary by one vote. So, uh, again, it's about giving uh, uh, students on college campus the ability to protect themselves. Dude, I appreciate your candor in answering that question that way. That's what you get from me all the time, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, dude. <laughs> That was kind of refreshing. I like that. Yeah. Here's the reality, damn it. If it's going to get passed, this is what has to happen. There's no other way of saying it. Billy. Yeah, PIA. What's, uh, what's action will be taken on that, uh, Jason, besides an Bill, infusion I, of dollars? I, I do appreciate you asking that question. And uh, the Senate on day one, we passed um, a bill that uh, increases reimbursement uh, for PEIA. And uh, it's an additional uh, $40 million uh, for that. As we spoke before, the hospital in Wheeling, uh, as of July 1, are no longer going to accept PIA. Uh, I think with this um, increase uh, in, in reimbursement, uh, that will change. Uh, it will be 110% of Medicare uh, payments, uh, which will uh, essentially let the hospital break even on on payments. Um, I think that you know we've talked a lot about PEIA, and and the reality is that uh, if we if hospitals stop taking PEIA, uh, it really doesn't matter to the employee what their premiums are because their coverage isn't going to be accepted anywhere. So I think it's absolutely necessary to do this. But for those folks that are not on PEIA that have private insurance uh, or have no insurance and pay cash. And they look at this and they may say, well, this is $40 million of taxpayer money um, using to go to, uh, to higher reimbursements. Uh, what about me? And, and what I would tell them is that, look, when the hospitals take PIA and they lose money and you go to the um, hospital with your private insurance or your cash, guess what? The hospital is going to increase uh, the charges to you to make up for what PEI did not cover. Uh, and so if that does, happens to your private insurance, then the trickle-down effect is that your, your premium goes up to, to offset those uh, increased charges from the hospital. So uh, I, I think it's, it's, you know, do we want to spend $40 million to do this? No. Uh, there's a lot of things I'd like to spend $40 million on, but it's absolutely necessary to ensure our state employees can receive care uh, and that we can do what's necessary to, to, to ensure hospitals get paid um, uh, enough to break even and again so this does not have a trickle down effect on those with private insurance or 
paying cash. But uh, Jason, PA came up as an issue, what, five, six, seven, eight years or so ago, and the solution at that time was a fusion of, uh, of additional money. Uh, no structural changes were made. Do you anticipate this time that you'll, in addition to the $40 million, you'll look at some of the structural changes, such as spouses uh, can, uh, can use uh, PIA as opposed to the third-party insurance? Well, I think we should. Uh, I don't know that we will. In the governor's proposed budget, there's an additional $19 million to freeze PEIA premiums. Um, so here on one end, we're going to increase um, payments to hospitals in reimbursement rate. And now we're going to, what the governor wants to do is freeze those PEIA premiums so that you get more coverage, you get, you know, there's higher reimbursement, but your premium stays the same. Um, you know, I, it's something we're going to have to look at, and, and this $19 million keeps premiums from going up, and that 80-20 match uh, has long been out the window, and, and we're looking to get figure out what those uh, exact numbers are. Uh, but I think from a to be fiscally responsible and do the right thing by the taxpayers of West Virginia, we have to look at structural changes to PEIA. I uh, and, and also being being very mindful that, that a lot of our state employees are underpaid. I, I, I respect and understand that. Um, I support continuing to give raises to those folks. Um, but at the same time, we you know we have to look and do what's right. We, we cannot continue to kick the PEIA can down the road uh, and just continue to infuse tens and tens of millions of dollars to keep premiums um, flat without going up when the rest of the country uh, and, and everyone else with private insurance is seeing increases to for premiums. But again, it's the structural changes that you're talking about. Uh, where I don't have a problem with spouse being on the insurance, but if if we base the premium on salary and some uh, and a school teacher makes forty fifty thousand dollars and they're married to a surgeon who's making two million dollars a year and their premium is based on a forty or fifty thousand dollars salary, I'm not sure that's that's fair and that's the way we ought to do it. It's the only insurance that I'm aware of that the premium is based on uh, income and not risk, health risk. So, Do you, th do you see any appetite in your ca fellow caucus members to ta make these structural changes? You know, I, I think so. And, and uh, there are, you know, a few new members of the Senate, but, I, you know, I think the Senate has kind of always shown that, that they're willing to take on some of these uh, issues that, that may not be, um, all that politically advantageous, and, and there may be some political backlash over. House members are, are very different from that, um, and that's not the case. Um, so because they've, um, you know, because they get elected every two years, because, you know, there, there are a lot of new members that get, you know, scared over some every issue, and, and so, you know, that, that's just the reality of politics. But at the end of the day, I, I think it will make the case that these structural changes are absolutely necessary uh, and, and frankly, in the best interest of the employee, because we want them to, to have insurance, quality insurance moving forward. We want hospitals uh, that will take their insurance and, and we want to be um, you know, fair to taxpayers of the state as well. Um, Jason, Delegate uh, Hardy moments ago said he had no appetite for a 5 percent raise without some type of locality pay being tied to that. Do you share that sentiment? Yeah, I've been um, I've made that statement as well, and that's you know especially to those members of the Eastern Panhandle Caucus that um, you know I said this is uh, this is our opportunity, and, and we've gone along with five percent pay raises for a number of years. I've supported them, I've advocated for them. Uh, I, I think it was absolutely necessary, uh, but at some point we're going to have to draw the line in the sand and say, okay, we agree that that um, our folks and our, our public employees still need a pay raise. Um, but today's the day that locality pay is going to be part of that if you want our support. And I'm willing to take that stance now. So, so you're willing to vote no on a 5% pay raise if it does not include locality pay? I, I think that's entirely possible, yes. Okay. What, do you have any idea what a 5% pay raise costs these days? To the state? Yes. Yes. Uh, a few dollars shy of $115 million. If you don't shy of 115, and, and that is the that is the salary portion of it. Now you have to you know also consider that you know the the retirement increase that comes with an additional five percent 
you know, that, that unfunded liability comes along the way too. And that's, that's around 60 million. So the total cost, I'd put it at about 175. Okay. So do I have to let you go? Are you, in a, are you running late for something or do you have time for a math question? Go ahead. I'll, well, I'll do the best I can. Okay. So I'm, I'm trying to figure all these numbers here, right? So John Hardy said that the first 30% state tax, uh, personal income tax cut would cost $800 million, and we have to set aside another $700 million in a fund in case this whole thing collapses upon its own weight. Uh, the governor, in addition, wants $40 million for hospitals, $37 million in the school aid formula for concentration on first grade, and uh, $10 million for the food bank. He wants $100 million in the PEIA, plus the $175 million for the pay raises that you just gave us as a number, $15 million for the Hope Scholarship, $75 million in higher ed for building maintenance, a million into a child pregnancy center, $20 million for nursing programs, $10 million for EMS funding, $5,000 incentive for veterans who want to move back to the state, and he would also uh, want uh, $250 million for putting all the state's labs under one roof. Does... Uh, and there's another 400 something million to be spent on broadband. Does all this add up with the amount of money coming in? No, and that's why I was extremely cautious at the beginning of this interview uh, with <laughs> rushing to pass personal income tax reduction when we have to weigh it against all that spending that you just outlined. I appreciate your frankness on that, sir. Jason, thank you. If you have a final word you want to get across, this is a great time to give it. Well, look, we, we are absolutely committed to reducing personal income tax. Uh, we are going to do this in a very thoughtful manner. We're going to weigh it against spending that the governor wants. Uh, we're going to do right by the taxpayer. Um, it's just not going to happen uh, in the first week of session. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate your Thank time. You. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, yep.